Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor College of Medicine. So first I have to apologize. Uh, you don't know a lot about my sister, but my sister uh, is now retired, but was a uh, professor of film and media. And so she's uh, constantly criticizing uh, all of the, you know, YouTubes. And uh, she pointed out last week was just way too much science. Way, way too much science. And uh, so, uh, Janet, for you today, there will be less science and hopefully a few more uh, pictures so you can understand what we're talking about. Anyway, first let's start with the numbers. Uh, we, we keep setting new records. We've, we're over 16 million cases in the United States, over 300,000 deaths. We're doing 2,000 cases a day. If any country needed a vaccine, it would be us. First one, we're in line, we're number one, so we need all the help we can get. Uh, if you look at where, where it is, of course, we've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, the upper Midwest, uh, the central Midwest, Arizona, Texas, these are all the ones that are per capita quite high. But also uh, in Tennessee and Kentucky, Illinois, Chicago I don't get, but it is really a mess. If you look at new, new cases, the last 14 days, the, the hot spots, check out Southern California. I mean, it's bad enough to be there most of the time, but now it's the wrong time to be there. Just a hot spot for cases, and Chicago is really hot, uh, parts of Texas, and New Jersey and New York are coming back again for reasons that are all, all, not all that clear to anyone, actually. Uh, if you look at the uh, Texas map, Lubbock, and El Paso, actually Abilene also, uh, lots of cases, and so, you know, we're, we're about the same as we've been. And if you look at the curves, Lubbock and, uh, and El Paso continue to lead. Interestingly, all the big cities uh, were kind of about the same, as you can see, kind of slowly trickling up. Abilene, however, made a big jump trying to get into the big leagues of, of, of lots of cases. But, as, you know, what, it's interesting to look at all the municipalities because uh, we're doing pretty well relative to the rest of the country. But... You know, Miami is having a surge. Chicago is having a surge. It's led uh, Chicago, actually, to uh, stop having gatherings more than six people. Miami uh, has, uh, has, you know, had some problems. California is restricting uh, activities a lot more. And Chicago's, as I said, it's a mess. So we're actually, uh, as, as, even though we're not good, we're, we're definitely not good, we're doing better than many of the other uh, municipalities. Uh, our, our, our number has been around one again. We've sort of trickled on down. Uh, we need it to be well below one. Uh, our test positivity uh, remains above 5%. It's around 75 to 8%. And I, I wanted to show you some of the trending data. The seven-day trend data, I think, is a little easier to see. This is the, the trend of our test positivity rate in the Texas Medical Center region. And you can see it's consistently trickling up. It was, at, you know, at our best, we were down at 3.5% uh, in early uh, September, and now we're back at over 7%. And our cases continue to be between, somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000, and varies each day. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, how many people we're sampling. But you can get the overall trend through the seven-day average. We're going up. Uh, we hit uh, last week 2,300 cases, which was as high as we hit in the middle of July. So we're kind of back to where we are, but again, our rate of rise is not as high. And, and I think that's uh, particularly obvious if you look at our hospitalization rates. This was our peak hospitalization. That was when we really worried about capacity. Right now, we're, we've been running about 100 and, over 100 cases a day, but it's going up very, very slowly. And we all are hoping we, our best guess is that we will peak somewhere late in December, early January, and things will start to get better. If you look in the city of Houston, where are the hot spots? This is a study uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Amos did, uh, head of our uh, Institute for Clinical Translation Research and an epidemiologist. And it looks like northern suburbs of, of Houston, some of the southeast and southwest, it's pretty clearly in communities of color. Uh, people with high, high density uh, uh, rental properties and people in service professions. So it's not surprising who's, who's having problems controlling the, uh, the epidemic, but you know, it also shows the disparities. It's really, 
it, it's really not fair. I mean, some people can't, you know, go to their vacation homes and hang out. I mean, a lot of people have to work and in the service professions don't have the resources to be able to isolate. And so that's where you're seeing the spread most likely in, in our city. Now, one of the coolest things that happened, we finally have a prevalence study. Uh, and I, I give a big shout out to uh, Tony Piedra's lab and Rice collaborated with us and the city of Houston to try and do a prevalence study. So what is a prevalence study and why do you need it? Well, prevalence is the number of people that actually have either had the disease or have it. So that's not the same thing as incidence. Incidence is the number of people who are getting it every day. Prevalence tells you how much of our community has been infected. And, and why is that important? Well, for one thing, we talk about herd immunity all the time. We need to get to 60 to 70 percent of people who've been exposed to the virus. Well, how, what percentage have had it already? We do not know without a prevalence test. So it gives you an idea what the risk is remaining for the population. It, always, it also can point out which communities are particularly high risk. Is it one uh, uh, zip code versus another where there's more disease? Uh, it's a way the city can target their resources. If you need to you know, race to a particular area to do more testing, you want to do it where the virus is, not where it ain't. And so that's uh, another good way to do it. Uh, and so it's really, really important. And there are very few communities have done a good prevalence study. Uh, New York City did one, and they're about 20%. So that's a very, you know, one in five people in New York City have been exposed to the virus. Uh, there is one that uh, Eric Borwinkle and the University of uh, Texas's public health department is doing with the state. Their data show that in the county it's about 17 to 18 percent. So what is the prevalence in the city of Houston? Uh, so this study was conducted by, as I mentioned, Rice and, and Tony Piedra's lab. Uh, it was conducted from September 8th to September 19th. They uh, sampled 678 people. There will be a second phase and a third phase to this where more and more people will be uh, sampled, but interestingly enough, the prevalence was 13.5 percent, which is a lot lower than I expected. I expected us to be around 18 or 20 percent, like the county and the city of Houston. So, if you assume we have 2.1 million people in in the city of Houston, that's 285,000 people who have the disease. Well, how many have we detected? 57,000. So, you know when. When people like me are asked, or Peter Hotez on the television are asked, how many people do you really think have it? I mean, we're testing, we get a 2,000 today, how many really have it? And we, we all guess, maybe five to 10 times more. Well, it turns out it's five times more. So it's exactly five times more. We've said five to 10, but it's five times more. Uh, so if you think about um, what, would have, you know, what would happen if we just let the disease run rampant throughout our community, uh, we would have five times more the hospitalizations and five times more the mortality. So uh, getting to herd immunity by vaccine is the way we want to do it. Now, if you look at the individual people who are actually most affected, and again, it's kind of surprising, men uh, were much less than women. Women uh, have a prevalence of 17% in our city versus men of 10%. Hispanics, the highest prevalence of 18%. Uh, blacks, 15%. And non-Hispanic whites, only 5%. And again, as we've talked about many times, probably driving this uh, local epidemic more than, more than anything are people, young people. So under the age of 40, it's 17% prevalence, over the age of 49%. So what are the conclusions we can reach from this kind of a study? Well, first of all, uh, there's a lot of virus around, particularly in the female Hispanic population. Uh, Another thing that's obvious is the impact of ethnicity uh, and the disparities in health care in our city. Clearly, communities where people have to are in the service profession, uh, communities that have less resources, less uh, availability to health care, are the ones being most impacted. Uh, we also can see that young people are driving this more than older people. We've sort of known that, but this is good evidence for that. Uh, and then the other thing is, I mean, I think positively, relative to other municipalities, we're actually lower. And so why would that be? Well, one reason might be that we've actually followed public health measures better than other municipalities. For one, we've had a county judge that has been uh, very, very forceful about wearing masks. We've had a mayor that's been very forceful about wearing masks. We've closed down some of the 
uh, large gatherings. I wish we'd close bars down a little bit more, but we've done a pretty good job. And I think it also means that people in Houston are actually paying attention. Uh, the reason I like that is it also means that if people in Houston are paying attention to public health measures, hopefully they will pay equally as much attention to getting vaccinated. So as we roll out vaccines, maybe we will be the first municipality to reach herd immunity through vaccination. That would be uh, an incredibly great thing. Now, you know, so the other big news, of course, is we received our vaccines this week and people are getting vaccinated. Uh, and the reason we are getting vaccinated is because of the approval of the FDA for emergency use authorization. And I thought I'd just let you know what that means. So, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of a shortcut to the usual process in that uh, after you've completed enough data, uh, it is possible for a committee of people who are looking at the data to recommend for, to a company to try and get to emergency use authorization. And that is a mechanism for the FDA to facilitate uh, the approval of, of anything, actually, of a, of a device or or a medication that can be used in a public health emergency. Well, a pandemic is, is definitely a public health emergency. Well, the thing about this particular emergency use authorization is all the phase one trials were done, all the phase two trials were done, all the phase three trials were done. And in fact, uh, there's a data safety monitoring board that is independent, that looks at the data, reviews the data, and after seeing how impressive the results were, they recommended to the manufacturer they apply for emergency use authorization. And when that happens, there's a public meeting that's held. It's called the VRBAC. It's the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. You've seen all this play out in the news. They look at the data independently. They make a recommendation to the FDA. And then the FDA has a chance to approve it or not, which they did. So the VRBAC suggested that uh, the FDA approve it, and the FDA did. Now, that hasn't cut out any of the usual processes. It does mean that uh, there, the three or four months extra data safety have not been followed. Um, and so the FDA is wanting the, the, the trials to proceed just to collect more safety data. Uh, and the CDC and the FDA will both be involved with making sure that the, that the uh, vaccine is safe. But I would tell you, you know, it's gone through uh, as rigorous a, 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 an approval process as any. So was there any other major news besides the vaccine? Well, there was actually very substantive new news uh, this week, which is that the FDA approved several new point of care tests. Now we needed point of care tests eight months ago. <laughs> you know, our, our ability to test people has been pathetic. You know, we, we screwed it up in the beginning. The CDC didn't do a good job. Uh, it took a long time for our, our uh, labs to come on board. Uh, we've been having problems with supply chain, even things like getting swabs, you know, and the reagents for the test has been difficult. So we really needed and ideally would have had a point, cheap point of care test early on that, that we could have done for everybody. But unfortunately, it wasn't available. But the good news is we're developing them now and we should be able to develop them later. So the one that got approved uh, recently is the, this Abbott by Nax Now test. It's an inexpensive, uh, it's called antigen capture test. The way an antigen capture test works is it really is very, it's really a simple design. Uh, you basically put a dropper on uh, a, a strip and the fluid just by capillary flow goes across uh, an, an antibody that recognizes the coronavirus. And then it's, it just moves along to an indicator line where there's another reaction that takes place so it can uh, show a, a, a color. And then there's usually a control involved. And so the, the way the, uh, the, the uh, Binax now uh, test works is you either get uh, one line, meaning you, you, the control worked, or you get two lines, meaning the control and, uh, and the COVID-19 was detected. So that is something that is going to be used in the first seven days of treatment. It is going to cost about $5. The problem with all of these quick tests is they're not very sensitive. So that means they may miss a lot. So if it's positive, it's very useful. If it's a positive test, you would go get confirmed, get a qPCR to know it's positive. If it's a negative, it doesn't really help you much. You can't guarantee that you're negative. But if you're following a group of kids, let's say 
a class uh, of, of elementary kids or middle school kids or a team. You could do daily testing, very easy nasal swab, uh, and, and be able to follow people and eventually pick folks up. So uh, that's what we actually needed before, uh, but we didn't have. There's also another test that, the, uh, that an Australian company has just re uh, released. The company's name is Illum. Uh, and it's the same kind of test. It's another antigen capture. In other words, it, it, it indicates when the viral particle is there, proteins from the viral particle. Uh, and the only difference between that one and the others is it has a better detector. Uh, it uses fluorescent particles, so it's a little bit easier for it to capture a positive. Than, than a pink line or a purple line. So that one's a little bit more expensive. That's a $30 test. It's about the same sensitivity, so it'd be the same as other antigen capture tests. The, the one that's kind of cool is, uh, is Lucera, which is coming up. That's a, a real-time PCR kit. So that's actually a quantitative RNA kit. It has a couple of batteries, and it does a PCR test, just like the, we do in the lab. Not as well, but pr pretty good. And that one's going to be by prescription only, and it's about $60. So all of these tests should be coming on board to make it easier for uh, multiple testing. And while it may not be as relevant to a country that has widespread vaccinations available, there's still going to be people who get sick. Remember, uh, even if we get 60 or 70 percent of the population um, vaccinated, there's going to be 15 to 30 percent that don't get vaccinated. And we will still have disease like we do with the flu. And we use the, the flu test uh, very often, you know, to, to see if somebody's got the flu. I could easily see this being adopted to see if we have coronavirus. So these are really big advances, uh, a little bit late in the game, but definitely big advances. So all very exciting uh, new developments uh, uh, on the horizon. Now, uh, the thing I wanted to say most is uh, to everyone, it's looking good. I mean... We are finally uh, beginning the rollout of vaccines. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine uh, is, you know, was approved. Uh, I want to do a particular shout out to our alumni this week, and particularly to Dr. William Gruber, who is an SVP at Pfizer and in the vaccine program. He's one of ours, uh, and he was uh, testifying to the FDA and helped get, uh, get the vaccine approved. So, you know, we finally have the, the, the tunnel is ending. Uh, we have Pfizer on board. Uh, we have Moderna coming on almost certainly uh, next week. So we will begin to roll out vaccines to frontline workers and the vulnerable population within the next several weeks. Hopefully within two, three months, uh, we'll get it to the general public. Now, just because uh, people had some concerns about, you know, whether the safety and all, I was the first one in line. So. So I actually uh, got the Pfizer vaccine uh, this past week. You can see if you want to see a picture of me uh, whining and squinting a little as I get my vaccine. I, I, I got it uh, over at Ben Taub. Uh, and uh, a lot of people have asked me, well, what's it, how do you feel? What's it like? Does it, does it hurt? Does it have side effects? And I was trying to think, how do I feel? Well. It took me a while to come up with exactly the right description of how I felt, but in the words of one of my heroes, whose picture I keep on my desk at all times, I feel good. So have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you next week.